Welcome everyone. My name is Andrew Hunt. On behalf of the Bullvine and Zoetis as well as Holstein USA, we appreciate you joining us today for the second in our series of webinars on genomics, its uses and the benefits of working with genomics. It is our, my honor to introduce Dr. Wagle today as our speaker. Dr. Wagle is very well educated, uh, as you may see when you read his bio, but he also uh, works with cattle, comes from a very dairy background, still involved in the registered dairy cattle background. And I've had the pleasure of speaking uh, with Dr. Wagle quite a few times, as well as know that he tries to bring both sides to the table to the equation. So it, it's a real pleasure to have someone of his caliber and his expertise to work and to explain to us maybe why genomics is working for those who maybe aren't as familiar with it and the benefits of using genomics in your breeding strategies. So uh, I'll pass things over to Dr. Wagel to get started and appreciate you taking your time to speak with us today. Well, Andrew, uh, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to get this set up and hosting this uh, uh, seminar that uh, really appreciate it uh, as very cool technology. Uh, just to remind everyone, uh, today's talk uh, is uh, proof that technology works, uh, but it's the, the second in a series of talks. The introduction to genomics uh, was a couple weeks ago, and that uh, seminar was also taped and is available on the bovine for you to view. Hopefully today's uh, talk will go well enough that it will also be placed on the bovine for later viewing, and uh, you can see then we've got six more talks to go through. So what do we want to do today? Well, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about this technology. It certainly has had a huge, huge impact on the industry. And uh, so we want to look a little bit about how well the technology actually works. And uh, you know, this technology lets us look right at the animal's DNA. And so you know, how does that translate to real herd differences out there? And, and, and that's what we're going to focus on. And then we're going to visit just a little bit about why some herds see better results than others and uh, have some uh, uh, informative words from some of our producers and look at uh, the impact of multiple trait indexes and then uh, take a little sneak peek at what's coming next. All right, so this testing is really getting under the hood and looking at what we have in this animal. It's always exciting. I've been involved in uh, uh, Richard Holstein since I was a little kid and it's always a uh, Always exciting to see that new calf and see what the potential of that animal is uh, as it grows up. And now this technology lets us look a little bit early. It's pretty, pretty cool. As uh, as many of you, many of you involved in registered Holsteins or uh, background in uh, uh, industry, you're well familiar with parentage testing. Back, uh, I'm old enough that uh, I remember the days when we did blood testing on Holsteins to prove who the sire of the dam was. So we had to always record that. And eventually we went to a microsatellite test and now we get that as part of this test today. Uh, the other thing we get that uh, we're probably pretty used to is testing for some genetic recessives. Uh, many of us remember back a mule foot in the day, you know, we had to have, uh, we had these carrier animals, actual mule foot females and we'd flush uh, a uh, prospective sire to that heifer to see if he carried that gene. Uh, we had to do some embryo transfer and then uh, abort the fetuses and look at them and see if they all had uh, cloven hoofs. And uh, if eight of them had uh, normal feet, we felt pretty good that they were, he was the bull was free. So we've made a lot of progress in this technology. DNA testing is something that's probably pretty familiar with everybody. The neat thing about this test is you get all this together. And what we're going to talk about today a little bit more so is the production traits, because those are the easiest ones for folks to see uh, and see how well this, prob this uh, uh, technology works in a, in a real life situation. And like I said, we'll talk just a little bit about net merit at the end here. So again, this is uh, really just like CSI. I mean, uh, you know, uh, first thing we do is we look at the gender. Uh, we can tell if that, uh, look at the DNA, we can see if we got a boy or a girl. And that's, uh, we had some, you know, with calf hutches the way they are and ear punches, uh, you'd be surprised we get in some uh, gender mistakes now and that, uh, and calves being born at all hours of the day. So uh, that's the first step. And uh, the next step is we get that parentage uh, uh, fixed up. And again, if our customers are using AI sires, Virtually all of them have genomic results today, and they will be discovered. Likewise, if they've 
tested some females uh, that and uh, they have calves. We'll they will detect who the who the real mom is. And again, this is very useful. We kind of gloss over this a lot of times, but uh, in the data we get in pretty routinely, uh, the sire error rate is about 15%. Uh, so 15% of the time we get a sample in. Uh, they think they know who the daddy is, and the test suggests that maybe they had an error, and there's a lot of different places for that error to occur, as you all know. The technology has evolved quite a bit, and if we, if we have a good AI sired herd, uh, for the most part, we can detect that maternal grandsire, uh, and we say most cases, I think it's 95%, uh, we find that uh, maternal grandsire, so it's very useful to get that. Because we want to get parentage of, uh, corrected, because we know that, uh, you know, breeding closely related individual results in inbred offspring, and this test finds that. Uh, it's not surprising if we have poor uh, pair, uh, sire ID that we will make some very close matings and have some pre-inbred offspring. I haven't checked the database uh, for quite a while, but I remember last year I looked and uh, we had tested a Holstein heifer that was 45% inbred. So that is very, very closely uh, 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 bred offspring for quite a few times. So that's pretty a while. We want to avoid that, obviously. On the other end of the spectrum, this, this technology only today Again, it's an ever-changing technology, uh, but today it only works on uh, cattle that are purebreds. And we say purebred, we mean pretty much uh, at least seven-eighths of a breed uh, that it offers. Uh, again, it doesn't have to be 100%, uh, but the, 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 more, uh, the higher percentage of purebred, the better. And uh, I'll just mention this because every, uh, every so often we have someone who wants to test this. They, they, they wonder if, if two labs are the same and the test really works and they'll send, uh, send an animal in twice with different numbers. And it, this just causes a lot of headaches. Uh, you know, the test, yeah, it finds it and it says, hey, there's an error. We've got uh, a non-twin duplicate genotype here, what's going on? And uh, that's a headache for us all. So it, it, the technology really does work. And so what is the basis for the increased reliability? It's great to get the parentage fix, we get the tests of the, of the, of the uh, genetic recessives, but we're pretty much focused on making genetic progress. And why, why does this technology work so well for that? Of course, we know that you know, parent average assumptions of offspring will reflect the average genetic merit of the parents. Again, we, if we, for example, we have a cow whose rear teeth are too close together and we don't like that, you know, we'll mate her to a bull that, that we, we want to get those rear teats apart a little bit. You know, on average, that'll work. We'll get those rear teats apart a little bit, uh, that, and everybody's happy. But, uh, of course, we know around that there's variation. We, we could end up with a heifer that has the teats even more closely placed than her mother, or they could be extremely far apart. That is Mendelian sampling. And this technology lets us look into that a little bit. Again. A few years ago, we thought maybe there was major genes that affected uh, our traits, and we speculate, well, what if there's a specific region, you know, that influences a trait, and so we could track that major gene and see, wow, this, this has a big impact, and so we want to find if this calf received that, that big gene. And, of course, our, our thinking has changed quite a bit as we got into that. didn't really work all that well, just look at a few genes. So what we've done is we've gone to this marker-assisted uh, selection uh, situation where we've got 50,000 markers now. And, and we estimate the value of every one of those 50,000 markers for each of the traits, and we track those. And, and next week is proof week here in the United States, and so there'll be a new estimate of those, each of those 50,000 markers for, the 50, 000, for the, all the different traits we work on. And uh, because we'll have new information that has flown into this uh, system uh, through all your testing and classification and calving e scores and all the other data that is collected on your dairies. So, does it, here's an example of uh, a real. This is actually a mating of one of uh, uh, my cows a long time ago. Uh, now all these uh, daughters are. are Actually, they're finishing, uh, they're, they're into their second lactation, second and third lactations now. So this is quite a while ago, but th this is their, their net merit dollars index uh, values today. And you can see that I had a cow uh, that was fairly lowly inbred, and I, I used this sire 
and he carried this HH3 haplotype that had just been discovered. So it's a simple recessive, and we know if we mate a uh, carrier by a carrier 25% of the time, that resulting calf will get both copies of that deleterious recessive, and that'll be a bad deal. And so I, I, I have this dam. She does not carry, she did not carry the HH3, so I felt comfortable using that bull because he was, he was quite a bull, and I wanted to improve, get a better, better calf. And you can see right away the, you know, the age-old thing that we look at with, with, you know, as we follow genetics, you know, bulls carry that Y chromosome. And uh, you can see that of the 11 calves, we ended up with six daughters. So he transmitted that X chromosome six times, and uh, he transmitted the Y chromosome five times. So we've got our break. That's our first uh, thing that we can see very visually here, how genetics was transmitted. And then we can follow that HH3, and, and this is the offs. I was happy to get six, six girls, uh, but I also got six heifers, and uh, six of the offspring that carried that HH3. Again, half about half the time we knew that deleterious recessive would be transmitted to the calves. So that held up pretty well. So we, that kind of gets us started how we can, we're watching these genetic uh, traits be transmitted. The neat thing about genetics, again, we can look at the actual inbreeding. Again, I had this cow who was pretty lowly inbred. She was sired by an outcross sire. In fact, we had stacked two outcross sires together. But I knew going into this that her maternal great-grandsire was the same bull as was the sire of the bull I was using here today. So I knew even though my average of the parents inbreeding was 7.7%, I knew going into this that I'd probably have a higher inbreeding in the calves than that average because I knew at least one parent was shared between the two. Pretty close there, the pedigree. Again, the average inbreeding was 8.3%, but the range was 9.6%. You can see I had one calf that came back with an inbreeding of only 4.3%, very, very low, and then I've got this one heifer up here that's at 13.9. So huge differences in the inbreeding of the calves from a single maiden. So we're watching all these genes being segregated, uh, these markers being segregated across uh, the different lines. So that's pretty cool. And, and like the previous graph, every one of those markers has an effect. And uh, we estimate the effect of those markers for this trait called net merit dollars, which is the USGA's estimate of lifetime profitability for dairy cows. And we knew going into this parent average it was 397. And so we get these 11 calves, and the average comes out pretty close to 397, just slightly above that at 410 today. But again, the range is the big thing. I was, you know, we all we all like to focus on these calves. Wow, these three calves came out better than either parent. So they're, you know, I had this parent average of 397. I hope to get, you know, a better cow than I had before by using this good bull. And if I was lucky, maybe I'd have one offspring that was even better than this really good bull I picked up. Wow, I got three of them that were better than either parent. That's awesome. But that Mendelian sampling, as they say, is a double-edged sword. And you can see I ended up with four uh, offspring that were lower than my cow that I started with. And so that is, the, that is Mendelian sampling. That range between the best animal, 538, to the lowest, it was $212. That is huge. Again, that's lifetime profitability in dollars. That's, the, the, uh, that's a small example here of one mating. Here we've got uh, what we call a heat map. Again, this puts together data from 2,491 heifers. They were tested in a single herd. It was a, it was a mixed herd of uh, registered and grade uh, uh, females. And so, what we have here is if you look at this uh, on the top, uh, I should say on the, on the vertical here, we have the traditional net merit dollars decile. Again, so I'm looking at the parent average of these calves, and I've broken them into 10 groups, the bottom 10% and the top 10%. And then on the, uh, across the top, I've got the clarified genomic predicted transmitting ability for net merit dollars. And I've done the same thing. I divide these calves into 10 groups. So this is the bottom 10% on the genomic. This is the bottom 10% on the parent average. And if we look at this and we say, okay, if I'm interested in calling out 
the bottom 20% of these heifers. I've got, I've used those some sex semen, for example. I've got 20% extra heifers I want to sell. If I use that traditional parent average, those are the calves I would sell. And you can see, after we tested them, four of those calves here that we thought were in the bottom 20% ended up in the top 10%. And these, these four cells here are the ones that were culled by any index. Okay, either, either way, if we use parent average, we use the genomic results, these four uh, boxes, they all get sold. These are the ones we would sell on the clarified results. So you can see the numbers of calves that are different between those two results. In, in a full 52% of the calves that we would have sold on parent average would have been wrong according to the genomic test. Likewise, if we're focusing on the top end of the spectrum, we want to do something special with these, use sex, sex semen on these best heifers. These are the top 10% on our clarified test. And you can see the, on the parent average, some heifers we thought were in the top 10% ended up at the very bottom 10%. We sum up across all of these, 36% of them were correct using parent average. However, 15% of them come from the bottom half uh, of, the, of the heifers we, th we thought on parent average. And this is a, a pretty interesting thing we see routinely. Again, if we have a, if this herd had used some really, really good sires, their daughters would dominate the parent average list for sure. There's just, that's just the way it works. And if we look at the genomic results, we see a much more sires represented in the top just 10%. That, that Mendelian sampling says, okay, this heifer was not by the, what we thought was the best sire, but she got a really nice sample of genes and now she's at the very top. And that's pretty useful because because now we can turn around and use one of those top top bulls in the breed on that heifer and keep our inbreeding pretty reasonable. So that's very very uh, that's something that we probably don't emphasize enough as well. All right. Again, overall, you know, if we look, at this is called a heat map. They have the green. If you're within two uh, two places, they, we think that you did a you know you're pretty close, right? Uh, but but overall, only 45% of our heifers fall within that those two two ranges, and uh, and we end up with 11% that we would describe as extremely different in the reds. So they've really moved away from their parent average. They're much different heifer than we thought they were. All right. So was that really proof that this works? I mean, this this just says that the you know the GPTA the genomic results are different than the parent average. I think everybody agreed that on that before we started. Uh, but is it really better? And there's a couple key things we've got to, to, to get our heads around before we start on that. And one, that in dairy cattle, you know, we're very sire orientated. And we look, we used about eight, we're focused on AI bulls, and we don't milk bulls. So we, we put all of our estimated uh, uh, genetic abilities into transmitting abilities. Again, Predicted transmitting ability is one half the breeding value, and we're so focused on that because we, we look at bulls, they pass half their genetic ability onto their daughters, and that's what we measure. That's what we milk. That's what we, we, we see those differences in our herd. So, but when we look at heifers, we turn around and turn that around and start talking about predicted transmitting ability. Heifers, it's the same deal. It's half the genetic ability we passed on to her daughters, but breeding value is the best predictor of future performance. And breeding value is two times the PTA. So when we look at these PTA differences, we should expect to see double the differences in the heifers. We got one heifer that's zero for milk, one heifer that's 1,000. We should expect to see 2,000 pounds difference in their actual milk production. Again, the transmitting ability means we breed those two heifers, the same bull, there will be 1,000 pounds difference between their, their two daughters. But they themselves, when they're out there head-to-head -head competing, there should be 2,000 pounds difference between them. Again, this is a pretty simple uh, concept, but just really not well known in our dairy industry because we're so focused on bulls. And this is the second thing that, that uh, uh, we really got to look at. And this is the heritability for a trade is a herd parameter. Again, if we talk about milk production, today uh, in the USDA we say the uh, the milk production uh, of uh, and Holsteins, for example, the, is uh, 20%, and that means that uh, if we look at that uh, ratio, 
Uh, it means that 20% uh, of, of the differences we see in animals is due to additive genetic variation. And again, additive genetic variation, that's what we saw in my heifers and, and calves from that one mating. They spread out. That's, that's the variation among them for their genetic ability. Uh, and that's the you take and then we divide that that amount of genetic variation by genetic variation plus dominant genetic variation epistatic gene gene uh, uh, variation and environmental gene uh, environmental variance and that is herd dependent. There's nothing we can do about these three factors, but this is herd dependent. If we have a heifer that uh, it, it has pneumonia, you know she that's a big environmental insult. And we look at how much milk she's going to give, that's going to have a big impact. That is absolutely going to have a big impact. It's not going to make her better, right? It's going to, she's, going to give, she's going to have this genetic ability, but we're not going to be able to see it because she's got this bad pneumonia as a calf. Likewise, you know, our herds today, you know, it's been a very calm, uh, cool summer here in Michigan this summer. Uh, but, you know, in past summers when it gets hot, the herds that do a good job with ventilation, you know, they don't see the big swings in milk production. Cows that calve in August tend to really give a lot less milk in those and herds that don't have good ventilation. Herds that have good ventilation, it's not as big a deal to them. So we, our producers work night and day trying to shrink the amount of genetic uh, environmental variation. And when they do that, that denominator gets smaller and heritability goes up. If they are not a great manager, lots of insults, this term gets big and heritability shrinks. And the USGA, when they do the or CDCB, when they do the genetic evaluations, they standardize all the all the uh, data they get to a common uh, uh, population heritability. So when we go, why do I go through all that? Uh, so we go to a well-managed dairy farm. So again, down here on, the, on my lower axis here, I've got the original genomic prediction ability for milk on these heifers when, you know, this, this her, pick the herd tested these heifers that, uh, as they were leaving the hutch. And so we saved that prediction. And over here we have their first lactation 305 day ME milk in pounds. And uh, uh, so there should be a relationship, right? As we increase the genomic predictability for milk, uh, we should see the ME go up by two pounds. And if you look across here, you can see, wow, this herd is, you know, 32,000 pound herd. There's a phenomenal herd. Average herd in the United States today is about 24,000 pounds herd. So the USDA or CDCB have scaled their predictions to work in this 24,000 pound herd. We're putting these predictions to work in this herd. And instead of getting the two pounds, they're getting 3.2. If we look at the difference between the heifers at zero and the heifer that's thousand, instead of their only Instead of being 2,000 pounds, you can see that there's 3,000 pounds, 3,200 pounds difference between those two heifers. We know environmental influences still happen, right? I mean, that, that's, that's real life. You know, some, you know, this heifer had great genetic ability. Uh, she had a lot of problems. We tried it. It's hard work. That will take the steam. You know, that trumps genetics. We have cows that have issues. They don't meet their genetic ability. But I can always put this equation up here in this corner because these heifers here have limited genetic ability. They can get a little above herd average, but uh, boy, that's about all they can do. That's that that they're capped out. So that is what we see again and again and again in our herds as we go forward. Does it work better than parent average? Yeah. Now this is a herd that doesn't have great parentage. They don't have full parent uh, information on their parents. That's why you see a lot of these dots are are stacked up. We're calling this a parent average, but in reality, it's, it's uh, for some of these heifers, it's half the sire PTA because we just don't know much about the mom and maternal grandsire and, and to get a proper PA. So we see the same kind of a slope, but the correlation is much lower. Uh, you just, you know, you would call some pretty decent heifers if you called all of those heifers. Again, if we look at another herd, how does that translate into economic value? Again, if we, uh, we're, we're pretty bi uh, big believers in this idea about marginal milk. And the idea of that is uh, it takes 55, pound, uh, 55 pounds of dry matter to support the lowest heifers here, uh, their production. We know these heifers to make uh, another 7,000 pounds of milk. They need to eat more. That's, that's the way it works. But the nice thing is they only eat a half a pound of dry matter for each pound of extra milk. 
So that's what we call marginal milk production, and that's really valuable. And so when we start to sum that up across, we take all those, the top 10% uh, of the heifers here for our genomic prediction for milk, they're at 1281, and we look at them, they're given 32,000 pounds of milk, and that translates into three and a half dollars more than these heifers, which are, you know, were predicted to produce uh, minus, they were PTAs were minus 437. Uh, again, there's about a ton difference between them for milk, uh, but there's 7,000 pounds of actual production. So that's what we see in these herds, and that translates into real dollars every day. Uh, again, this this milk price, you might look at that and uh, and uh, wish they was still here, but it's not. And uh, but uh, so these heifers are probably underwater today, but these heifers are still making money. Again, this is. Uh, just amazing how consistent this is as we look across different herds. And uh, here we're, we're comparing it to parent average in, in uh, herd. And here's our genomic predictions. You can see that this uh, bottom 10%, they're just, that's a long tail uh, that we call it in statistic terms uh, that they really had some very low heifers there and they, they matched their predictions. They did not milk very well. We have same thing on the high end. These, uh, we have these very best 10% include some real outliers and they're above the line if we fit there a little bit, but you can see those lines, those bars match up pretty well. And if we look at the top to the bottom, again, 7,700 pounds difference between the top to the bottom 10%. We rank the same heifers on parent average, bottom 10%, uh, you know, they're lower, but they're not quite as low as these heifers. Uh, uh, actually, they're better than these heifers and these heifers. So our lowest decile is here for some reason, and that's just, not as accurate. That's just the way it works. And we look at the difference between these two groups, it's 2,200 pounds difference. Uh, that's what improved accuracy looks like. You feel much more confident calling this bottom 10% than you do this bottom 10%. All right, uh, this is results that you may have seen in Horace Derriman uh, uh, back, uh, I guess it's been a while now, uh, six months or so. And uh, from Kent Weigel at the University of Wisconsin, and his uh, assistants there. And uh, what they've done is rank these 400 and some heifers on whether they use the genomic prediction and how much milk did they give versus using the sire PTA for milk and how much milk did those heifers give. Yeah, if we put that into a, a graphical form, uh, the blue bars are the genomic predictions and you can see, wow, yeah, there is a big difference between the top 25% and the bottom 25%. And that's a pretty, uh, those bars fall on that line pretty well. And we look at the sire PTA milk. We, we said these are by the worst sires, but uh, they're not terrible there. And they are behind. Uh, but when we look at the top end, we thought with these heifers were going to be by the very best sires. Surely they'll be much, much better than the next 25%. They're about the same. So again, that's what we compared differences. We don't, we're not as confident uh, that these are bad and we're not as confident that these are good as we are with the genomic predictions. We tend to focus on milk probably too much. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I agree with that. Uh, uh, large, a lot of our producers don't have the ability to, to uh, measure components, but we know everyone, uh, most everyone gets paid on fat and protein today. And it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone if we look at the, uh, uh, the results are very, very similar for fat and protein. Uh, if we rank them on parent average, uh, the genomic predictions here, we've changed things up a little bit and put them in red just to see if you're awake. And uh, the, they're much more, these, uh, the slope as we improve is uh, uh, much better than the parent average. Here we find the right 25% in the bottom, but they're really not much better than the third uh, quintile. So uh, still very consistent across the traits. So what are producers saying about, uh, what are they seeing out in the field? Here's some video from some of our customers. Parent averages alone, you're running about 30 to 35% reliability. With Clarified, you're, you're more than doubling that, approaching 70% reliability. I think that's only going to get better. Parent average uh, isn't quite the reliability as maybe we thought it was. When you look at genomics versus their PTAM for milk, there was huge differences. Using the genomic testing that Clarified provides, uh, you're able to increase that reliability and really have sound science behind some of the decisions that you would make. We found that we would have been calling 
some of our better animals and we would have been keeping some of our worst animals and there was no way to decipher. Using Clarified, we're going to be able to increase the genetic value of our herd quite rapidly when we are culling out the correct 10%. So, um, what about multiple trade index such as net merit dollars? I mean, we, I, I focused on milk production here because it's really easy to see and, and for our folks to measure. And, uh, uh, but what about net merit dollars? Does it really reflect profit or longevity? And so this is a, a set of heifers that we tested uh, quite a while ago. Again, our, we had to prove to our internal people that this test really works because they, they were a little bit dubious that we could take uh, a little hair sample from these heifers and really describe uh, their performance that well. So we sampled 240 heifers. Uh, they were just uh, in early lactation, about 65 days in milk. We uh, sampled them. And then this herd was rapidly expanding. So we felt like they would stay in that herd and have their ability to do what they're gonna do. And what we can see here, we sampled them in early lactation. We look at how many of them actually finished that lactation. Uh, and um, it's a little bit bumpy. Again, we sampled about six days in milk, as you would guess. They uh, they would have problems. Uh, most of them are behind them at that point. And so the highest 20% uh, uh, of the heifers, about 90% of them finished that lactation, but it doesn't seem like there's much of a relationship across the rest of them. However, when we go to that next lactation, how many of them made it to 90 days in milk to the next lactation? Fully a half of these first heifers are gone. Uh, again, this is a herd that was rapidly expanding. They wanted these heifers to hold that stall full, you know, it's because they knew they were going to have to buy a replacement heifer if she didn't. And uh, so they give her every chance, but fully half of them disappeared, whereas the top 25% for net merit dollars stuck around much better, much better. Again, we've got a question, what is the average replacement rate in the United States? Uh, we run about, we're down to 2.2 lactations here so in the United States, so heifers don't last very long. Part of that is uh, people cull uh, more heifers than they should probably. But uh, in this herd, again, the cull rate was quite low because they wanted to keep these heifers in the herd. But yet when we look at that lowest percent, fewer than 10% of them made 90 days in milk of the, of the fourth lactation, whereas we're over 40% for the other group. Again, just to blow that up. How many were left three years after we, three and a half years after we tested them? Wow, that is phenomenal. That is, you look at 10 you know, 12 percent left versus a full 50 percent uh, based on this little, little hair test. Pretty cool stuff. Again, to summarize our our talk today, a few points. Hopefully, we can take away from this that uh, you know this works. Uh, we it's pretty easy to show. We're happy to demonstrate it to our herds because we know it works. And the, the, this, herd, this concept is absolutely real. Well-managed herds see a better response than average herds. That's just a, that is real life. You give these, these well-managed herds, they take care of the heifers, they don't let insults happen to them. They give these high genetic ability animals everything they need to, to really shine and they do their thing. Again, the response is consistent across traits. I think some more of the, the next seminars will show that. Uh, for those lowly heritable traits, again, Heritability is considered when they calculate that, that PTA. So if we see big differences in that genomic prediction transmitting ability, we're probably going to see big differences in the, in the performance. Again, this is the key right here. Predictions can be used to make confident decisions for females at a very young age. And the accuracy of those predictions are such, so, such that we can really do some economic modeling to figure out how we're going to make money with this information. Again, you are buying information. When you do this test, it does not make your calves any better or any worse. They're the same calves as when you test them. If you don't have confidence to make decisions with this data, save your money, because you've got to do something with this data. We're giving you information. You bought information. You have to do something with it. And hopefully, you have the confidence that when you make a decision, hey, I'm going to sell this heifer. I don't think she's going to be that good. This test says it's not, she's not going to be very profitable for me. You need to follow through and sell her. Likewise, you need to turn around to the top end of your, your spectrum and say, hey, I really want a heifer calf out of this heifer, my best female. I want to drive the genetic ability of my herd forward. And so I'm going to use a good bull on her. I'm going to spend the extra money and get a good heifer out of that heifer. 
again, this is the second topic we've covered today. Uh, the, the next one is going to be going through that very uh, topic. How do we make money with this? Because we've got to do something uh, to, to uh, get our money we spent on this test. And just a quick preview of what we might see in that seminar. Here's, a, 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 again, a, us statistician types, we love bell-shaped curves. Uh, because uh, we, we understand the mathematical properties of these bell-shaped curves. And this is a slide that I created. Uh, again, this, these numbers are a little bit inflated. It's the genomic predicted transmitting ability for net merit dollars by birth year. So I created this last summer prior to the base change that we had last December. Uh, so the, the, all the PTA uh, for net merit dollars are like $185 higher than what, uh, what they would be today. But the blue bars represent all the heifers tested in this herd in, that were born in 2012. And you can see their average is 463 net merit dollars. Now that is phenomenal. That is a really, really exceptional result. And then the red bar, red bars represent the heifers that were born in 2013 and all of them were tested. And you can see, even though this herd is doing in Tense ET and doing everything they can and culling, there you go. You've got that same spread that comes back again. That's Mendelian sampling. That's genetic variance coming, expressing itself, and those heifers just keep spreading out. But the good news is, you know, with all that effort, this producer is making $89 on PTA uh, for net merit dollars, which is our estimate of lifetime profit per year. And, you know, the industry was doing $35 uh, uh, per year in the, in the five years prior to 2012. We, we think that uh, uh, 2015, we think that uh, things are speeded up. Uh, but still, this is obviously a tremendous herd here that is uh, clearly doubling up many of our uh, 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 of the peop other people in the industry, uh, at least for the amount of progress again. Again, if we remember to double that, we can we think, wow, uh, these heifers are going to average $180 more profit over their lifetime in just, uh, than the heifers born in 2012. That is phenomenal. The other thing we can take away from this, if this producer were to remove the bottom 15%, it doesn't matter which birth year he does this in, it's going to be very similar. If we remove the bottom 15%, these heifers here, it moves the average of all those left up by $40. Again, we got to remember to do that doubling thing. That that's $80 in lifetime profit. He improves the average of this group of heifers by, for just that generation. Of course, we know anybody who's involved in, in genetics knows it's a long-term proposition. And we're going to see that benefit carry forward. So their, their daughters will be $40 better. And the daughters that from those daughters will be $20 better. And the daughters from those daughters, daughters will be $10 better. So there's huge long-term payoffs going forward from here. Again, by, by making this decision to get this bottom end out of, the, out of the genetic pool that makes up this herd. All right, so that is the seminar from today. Uh, Andrew, if you have any questions, that would be awesome. Yep, I do. I'm just grabbing them. Some of the ones I got through email or that I got in the private chat box um, were somewhat similar, so I've merged a few together, um, but I'll ask them that way. So the question we have is, are there any programs that can tell us the expected genomic inbreeding values for potential matings? You were sharing earlier about the genomic inbreeding versus parent, parent average. Is there a predictor one? Yeah, so uh, currently in the, I, I, uh, Holstein USA, I know for sure, uh, you can log on uh, and uh, put in a, a, a potential mates, uh, sires for a heifer, one by one, and it will show you, uh, you put in the heifer and put in uh, prospective mates, and it will show you both the uh, traditional uh, uh, inbreeding that will result and the average genomic inbreeding that will result from that mating. I, I believe uh, um, uh, there's some other sites that do that well. Our friends in Canada, I think, also have the same uh, technology. Um, I, do, I personally don't keep up with the, uh, the bulls so much. Uh, the bull studs, uh, I'm sure they're working feverishly to improve their mating programs to do the same. Um, but 
those are the places I know that, that do, uh, that offer that service. No problem. Okay, and then our next question is, you talked about having a 20% additive genetic variance. Does that mean not expect to get calves 20% higher than their parents' uh, values? One more time. Uh, uh, you talked about having a 20% additive genetic variance. You were posting oh. about the uh, calculation Heritab for okay. uh, heritability and everything along those lines. That yeah, that no. Uh, that, yeah, that's the, that's the heritability of uh, milk yield. And, and so that means that 20% of the, the differences we see uh, among our heifers in our, in our cows are due to genetics. That's that ratio. Uh, Again, uh, uh, CDCB uh, actually lowered that uh, from point, um, uh, point, uh, 0.25 or 0.3 down to 0.2 uh, this last December. Um, we know that when we go to our, our, our well-managed herds that uh, the heritability is obviously significantly higher than that. Um, so that, that's what heritability is. It's the percent of differences we see among our, our females, for, so for example, stature, if we look at how tall cows are. We know the heritability of that, uh, the estimate, current estimate for that is uh, upwards of uh, 45%, uh, I believe. It's very, very heritable. It's one of the highest traits we have. So uh, if we look at the differences we see in size among our, our females in our herd, uh, we'll know uh, a great portion of that is due to the genetic ability uh, they possess for growth. Um, so that, and, but that would vary a little bit. Like obviously, if you have a very poor rearing uh, situation, uh, don't give them the groceries they need as calves you're not gonna see that uh, big a difference among the heifers uh, due to ge uh, genetic ability. If they have this great genetic ability, they may not, may not get there. So again, that, that's, that's, uh, that's a hard concept for a lot of folks, uh, uh, kind of a new one, but it's something that uh, uh, the, the folks that, that do genetic evaluations have seen for a long time. So they've, they realized they had to adjust people's data. If you have a very high heritability in your herd, well, we need to adjust your differences down because, you know, you can imagine that the differences are spread out more in high heritability herds. So we need to, to compress them down just a bit. And again, if we have a, a very low heritability herd, a, a herd that doesn't have very high performance, well, we need to spread those out a little bit to make them comparable to the average herd. So just as a follow-on question I have then for you, Dan, um, what is the range we would expect, say you had a even say a 500 net merit or a 1500 uh, uh, pounds of milk bull or heifer or mating. Um, is there a range we would expect like, you know, within 10% of their parent average is a range we should expect the, the variance to be from top to bottom of all the progeny or how would you describe that? Ah, yeah. So that, that, uh, that's an excellent question. So uh, obviously we, we've, got some tools that assess that a little bit, uh, but the key uh, to that is, is related to the first question. It is, uh, it's not the heritability so much, it's what's the, what is the additive genetic uh, standard deviation, or gen uh, the variance, of course, is the square of the standard deviation. So we need to find out what is the additive uh, genetic variance of that trait in a herd uh, and then uh, for the population, and then uh, we can uh, start to see how many standard deviations out they will be. So, for example, uh, just for easy math, uh, let's say that the, uh, the genetic standard deviation uh, for uh, net merit dollars today is $200. It's slightly, slightly uh, less than that, but for easy math, let's say it's $200. So, we would expect to see 67% 66, uh, of all matings to be, if we have that like my slide, uh, the, the parent average is 470. We would expect 60% of those calves to be within plus $100 uh, in, um, in, uh, above parent average and $100 below parent average. So I would expect 67% to be between 370 and 570. My parent average is, five, is 470. So plus or minus $100 will catch 66% of them. Uh, once we start going out to two standard deviations, uh, we only expect 5% total to be either above or below uh, our two standard deviations, or $200. So uh, you can see with my, my small sample there, I had one cap that was one and a half standard deviations above. So pretty much what you expect with small numbers. Does that 
answer the question a bit? Yep. Yeah, and I think it tells us the range that we would say within 300 and to say on net merit points. Uh, well, 399 percent. Yeah. Yeah, you would expect yeah. pretty much all of them to be within three standard DV. Yeah. So 300 points, say, uh, uh, of the genomic values of their parents. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, in that regard, sorry, I'm just trying to help with that answer. Sorry. Um, we had a question here. Uh, in five years' time, what percentage of producers do you think will be leveraging genomic testing in their breeding programs? <laughs> I wish I knew. Uh, yeah. You know, we certainly we've seen uh, a tremendous uptake here in the last uh, a couple of years. It's been uh, phenomenal. So uh, I I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's going to be very very high. I mean, uh, uh, we we see producers who uh, it all depends on how much they ex ex can execute. I mean, that's the key. What percent of the producers can execute on decision? If they make a decision. Uh, do they follow through on that? And, and uh, uh, again, we think that's going to get better and better, uh, and, and uh, people are going to realize, hey, this is this is something I have to do. This is not. Uh, uh, again, we keep pushing. I show that slide about uh, the one herd making eighty-nine dollars a year progress. That is that is getting after it. I mean, we definitely want our we don't want our customers to fall behind, right? So. We keep pushing them, and and, and uh, you know, obviously, better sire selection. It all starts with them. Uh, you know, that's what we keep reinforcing to people. Look hard at your sire selection. What, what what's the percentile rank of the bull you're using for the index you're you, you're choosing on? Will it be uh, LPI, net merit dollars, TPI? What is the what is the what is the percentile rank of your, the bulls you're using? Because that's what's going to drive uh, those calves as much as anything. And then the test just says, okay, of these heifers sired by good bulls, who got a good shake of genes and who didn't? Um, so that, that's, the, I guess, the, the thing that I would push folks for. Uh, where I've, uh, uh, it's been very gratifying for me more than anything uh, to see that genetics has become much more uh, a focus for the, for the herds we work with. It used to be thought of as a commodity, something they need to worry about. And now uh, I think folks are starting to realize this is something I have to engage in. This is a I'm doing everything I can management-wise. This is another lever I can push, and it works. And so uh, I think we're going to see tremendous increases. Uh, I think the improvements will be there. We, this is amazing how much improvement we've had in the technology in just a few years, and we'll probably continue to see uh, uh, more improvements. Okay. This next question I probably had asked probably about seven or eight different forms. So uh, I'll ask it as best I can. Um, you shared with us the uh, variances and the ranges in the net merit dollars as well as production data. Is there significant differences in accuracy or the data when you look at it for health traits and or, and or type traits uh, mm -hmm. when you're looking at the same analysis? Yeah, exactly. So. So there are differences in the traits uh, for the, the accuracy. And, and uh, so if we look across the, our traits uh, today, uh, daughter stillbirth would be the lowest accuracy, whether you're looking at a young bull you're deciding to use or, or, or a virgin heifer uh, getting this test result back. The, the accuracy uh, for a, uh, those heifers for that trait is going to be lowest. So uh, today um, when I look at my uh, full pedigreed heifers as an example, uh, they come back at about 55% accuracy for that trait. Uh, but yet, uh, when we look at herds, we can definitely see that we see response in that in that trait. Again, it's the lowest accuracy, but we have, we see big differences in the predictions, and so those translate into real results. Uh, the milk uh, has the highest uh, accuracy. The type traits, some of the type traits are extremely high accuracies. Uh, and uh, DPR and, and uh, uh, the repro traits, uh, for example, would be intermediate for accuracy today. And uh, heifer conception rate, uh, I think, would be a little bit lower as well. So the traits definitely do vary a bit for their accuracies, and that's published uh, for each, uh, each, each uh, calf for each trait gets an accuracy estimate. So, and uh, that does translate into uh, differences in, in uh, uh, how much they might uh, you know, that's an estimate of how well we understand the genetic 
ability of this animal, and obviously that translates into how well it performs as a result of those that, that genetic ability. Okay. Uh, next question is, what are some of the causes for the uh, for genomic testing results to be so much different than their parent averages? So you showed us early on that how how wide apart the parent averages were from the genomic uh, testing. Is there reasons for that that are explainable? Yeah. Well, actually, you know, Andrew, uh, I have my own herd, and, and if I knew the answer to that, we wouldn't be talking right now. But uh, so <laughs> I think that's going to be, you know, we talked about the inbreeding question earlier. Uh, you know, people ask, is there a method that we can look at to estimate uh, the genomic inbreeding? And, and I think this all ties together. You know, I think we're going to discover a, uh, a tremendous amount more about this as we go forward. I mean, today we don't have large numbers, but you saw that mating that I showed. It seemed like there, that was more variation than you should have seen in that mating. Why is that? You know, that that's uh, I don't know. I don't have an answer. Is that just a small sample thing? If I had done that same mating a hundred times, would it have fit the variation pattern a little bit better, um, or? or uh, not, is that there's something about the genetic ability makeup of those two individuals that I made that cause more spread than, than normal. So I think that's going to be an area of research going forward and, 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 and understanding inbreeding. You know, again, the old yarn about uh, when it works, it's line breeding. When it doesn't work, it's inbreeding. I think that's, we're going to start to unwind that a little bit and start to uh, pre un understand uh, how better to mate these animals. I think uh, right now we're just focused on the big rocks, you know, at keeping these cows alive and find out who's product, uh, you know, uh, who has the best producing ability. Uh, but obviously, we'll, I, I, we've had seen tremendous improvement in the predictions already, and we'll see even more. Okay, um, you we inbreeding. Uh, and this may be not as much to genomic testing, but is there an acceptable level of inbreeding uh, that we should be targeting? Yeah, that is a that is one thing that uh, that does keep us awake at night a little bit. Again, our, our as I just spoke about, you know, uh, uh, we're going to start to tease that apart. We know we want, for example, the genes that that that, that code for for more protein pounds. We we want more of those genes. We want to fix those. We want we want two copies of that gene. And uh, obviously, we've discovered some things, uh, the haplotypes affecting fertility, uh, they're at the extreme uh, other end. Uh, boy, two copies of those is, is a bad, bad deal. So I think we're going to unwind that a question a little bit. Uh, well, I think well, it's going to be a lot going forward and uh, um, really start to understand that today. Of course, our, our uh, guidance is based on the old parentage, uh, parent uh, age estimates of inbreeding depression. And it was $21 per percent, and it was linear. We didn't seem to see any spike up uh, as we went across uh, different inbreeding levels. Uh, we've got quite a bit of research to do to figure that out going forward. But again, today we're still uh, uh, still we don't we know there's more, we're going to find more of these inbreeding depression issues. So today our producers are encouraged to keep that low inbreeding as low as they can. Uh, again, the $21 per point is is what's out there. And that's uh, um, what people kind of tend to uh, gravitate to when they're making a decision. Um, another question is, if we started testing animals on our herd, do you recommend we test all animals or just the young stock? Yeah, we would, we would uh, tend to not test the cows. I, I think it's pretty tough to make a decision. Of course, the, 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 uh, the only exception to that rule would be is if you say, I'm, I'm thinking about it, I really want to, to accelerate my progress and I'm going to do some embryo transfer. I've got this uh, cow here that is really uh, a star and I think she's an outlier. I want to test, I want to do embryo transfer and I say, okay, yeah, that's, a, that's one that's worthwhile testing. Uh, but for the most part, uh, again, you've got to make actions to make this test pay. And uh, for most of our cows, they're going to finish their careers. And again, I tell folks it's, it's really not a culling tool. Uh, if I'm a producer, uh, my goal is to make the most money I can from the stalls I have. And so I don't care if that cow in that stall is lucky or good genetically. Uh, I want if she's making me a lot of money, she stays in that stall. And so, uh, uh, you know, 
Clearly, it's the best tool for figuring out the genetic abilities of these animals and who I want to contribute to the next level, but it's not really a culling tool. I don't think that's economical today. Uh, so we say let the cows do their thing and let's focus on the heifers. And, and uh, uh, for example, we, you can certainly justify testing springers, right? We want to keep this heifer, sell her as a springer. Uh, that You can do that. It's better to back up and test these heifers at 10 months of age or so and say, okay, do I want to keep this heifer? Uh, do, I want to, do I want to use uh, the top-notch bull on this heifer, or uh, is this heifer here not so great for heifer conception rate? Uh, should I, you know, should I put a, a more economically priced bull into her because she's going to struggle to get pregnant? And that's much, you know, that there's more decisions to be made the younger you test. So um, we encourage folks to test our pre-breeding heifers. That's the most bang for the buck. And uh, and uh, pretty much through spring, their uh, to the first calf, we will see uh, it, that's as economical to test after that point. And uh, this is actually a question from myself. I saved it to the last one. Um, as someone who deals with both sides of this, I get involved in guys who are traditional and show breeding as well as heavy into the genomic side. What would you say is the greatest proof that genomics testing and breeding is working? If you had to answer that in a couple sentences, what would you say to them to prove that it is working? Well, for for myself, uh, it, it takes no more than looking at my two-year-old pen. I mean, uh, wow! I mean, <laughs> uh, they are uh, uh, phenomenal uh, today. It, the, the amount of progress we've made against just year to year, you can see it. Uh, and uh, and for our particular herd, it, it, we look at uh, uh, fewer problems. And uh, uh, you know, can this heifer have a calf unassisted? Uh, can she have a live calf? Uh, can she avoid metritis? Can she? Because you know, we all know that's a report uh, that that's today a live calf. That's money, right? That's real money. And so uh, to get her off to a good start, and then uh, does she, you know, can she really do her thing uh, once she's got through those other he uh, hoops and give a lot of milk? Phenomenal, absolutely. Uh, that's the biggest thing, I, I guess. I uh, that uh, I look at, uh, uh, and we see this in all of our. The, 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 you know, it's pretty easy to demonstrate. We go to these these herds, especially that have a a lot of heifers the same age calving at the same time. Uh, it's always uh, amazing to me how we can see those heifers separate out uh, from this little, this hair this tissue test that we did two years ago. Just phenomenal technology. So yeah, it's not perfect today yet uh, for sure. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, we saw the lower heritability in, in Holsteins in the U.S. Uh, certainly, the, I heard a question a little bit about bias. Appears there's still some issues with that, uh, for sure. But uh, uh, and that's why we encourage folks to use young sires as a group uh, to to uh, take some of the risk out of them for that reason. But uh, we're as bullish on the technology today as we've ever been. Box. So I want to thank. Dr. Dan Wegel for uh, taking the time to share this with us. I think a lot of the time the debate goes back and forth on whether it's actually working or not. And to have both the stats as well as the practical understanding of this uh, is greatly appreciated. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today for the second uh, webinar in our series. There is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six more webinars to come, I believe. Uh, this dates are on the screen uh, as well as there will be emails coming. If you have any further questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. I'm sure I can pass them on to Dan and Dan would probably be more than happy to answer any questions at a later time, I would assume, Dan. Uh, Absolutely. And we do appreciate that and we thank everyone for attending.